Well, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to another Seo lecture series. And it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker today. His presentation is called State of Grace, the North Korean built Angkor Panorama Museum in light of DPRK Cambodian cultural relations. Douglas Gabriel is a 2020-2021 or 2020-2021 Korea Foundation postdoctoral fellow at GW. Uh, Douglas Gabriel received his PhD in art history from Northwestern University in 2019. And his current book project, Over the Mountain, Realism Towards Unification in Cold War Korea, 1980 to 1994, examines connections between the visual art of the Minju democratization movement in South Korea and the work of state-sponsored artists in North Korea. Previously, he was the 2019-2020 uh, Sun Young Kim postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University. Douglas's research on North and South Korean arts and architecture has appeared in the Journal of Korean Studies and Hyundai Museosa uh, the Korean Journal of Contemporary Art History. His work has been supported by the Fulbright Program, the Harvard Korea Institute, and the Northeast Asia Council of the Association of Asian Studies. It is my absolute pleasure, and I've heard him speak about other North Korean art, and it's, I'm just really looking forward to this talk as well. So Douglas, the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you so much, Emmanuel. Um, yes, I, I requested that uh, just because I know we have a lot of people who know uh, much more than I do about some of the various threads that I'm going to be um, tying together here. Um, so it's a real uh, privilege and pleasure to, to share this with you. I know this topic is a little bit um, different from um, the kind of main uh, thrust of my research that you heard about in the, the wonderful, uh, very kind introduction. So let me just say a, a few words about the larger project from which this lecture derives. Uh, very much a, a still a perspective project. Um, so for about a year now or so, I've been interested and in working very inter intermittently on a manuscript about sacred art and spaces in North Korea in and in relation to North Korea is maybe more accurate. Uh, so for example, one of the chapters looks at North Korean art and architectural writing on Buddhist sites like Sokuram in Gyeongju. And another focuses on North Korea's dealings with UNESCO in a prolonged effort to get um, the Goguryeo um, tomb complexes and certain monuments in Gaesong nominated and eventually um, inaugurated as world heritage sites. So the book as a whole investigates how religious cultural inheritance, uh, that is objects, spaces, and rituals have become entangled with representations of political power in North Korea. And one of its aims is to provide a, a corrective to conventional perceptions of North Korean culture as wholly divorced from the realm of the religious and indebted to um, sort of stock tropes of communist personality cults borrowed from the models of Mao and Stalin. And I contend that North Korea's reckoning with religious cultural heritage has very much inflected the aesthetic programs through which the state projects its power. Now, my presentation today is called from uh, what will likely end up being the last chapter. And it, it tries to think about how North Korea's melding of the sacred and socialist aesthetics has played out in the international arena. And this one was that, the one that I felt was um, maybe most presentable. So I'm uh, very happy to share this with you. So, Thinking back to the days when we could um, actually travel and go places, um, if any of you visited Angkor Wat in say the last five years, you may recall this central ticket office where you go to purchase uh, passes for the various um, temple complexes in Siem Reap. And right next to the ticket office is this giant uh, parking lot and it's right in front of the massive Angkor Panorama Museum, which was designed by a month today overseas project, a branch of North Korea's Central Earth Studio. And the space opened in December 2015, only to shutter its doors less than four years later in November 2019. 
uh, for its brief tenure, um, this is what visitors would have encountered inside. So um, immediately when you walk in, there's this large oil painting. And just keep in mind this smiling face because we'll, we'll come back to it later in the talk. Um, very important for the, the kind of historical narrative that North Korea tries to construct with this museum. And the uh, sort of introductory room that you walk into is filled with the kind of informational materials that you might find at, say, the Angkor um, uh, Historical National Museum in, in Sam Reap as well, with these kinds of scale models of the temple complexes. But its main highlight, though, is its panorama, or more, um, I guess, specifically its cyclorama, uh, which to get to, you have to walk down this kind of winding hall. And you enter into a room that is actually a 360 degree painting. So um, you're completely encircled by it. And it runs through a, a narrative in very much a cinematic fashion using lighting and, and visual effects to really guide your eye through a, a particular uh, path through the painting. So a very different kind of visual experience of the painting than what we would normally uh, experience in even in social studios. Quotes. Okay, so on at least one major front, the Angkor Venture veered from Mansude's representative work. And with this project, the studio engaged with overtly religious subject matter, giving shape to a singular condensation of socialist realism and iconography associated with Hinduism and Buddhism. In bringing the socialist and the sacred to bear upon each other, the museum proposed an unlikely convergence between the respectively secular communist and religious ideolog ideological foundations sponsored by the North Korean and Cambodian states. Well, but while, this, while the site is novel in the context of Mansude's exports, the Angkor Panorama Museum finds a peculiar precedent in what amounted to an enduring friendship between Cambodian Prince Norodom Sihanouk and North Korean leader Kim Il-sung. And I'll, I'll show a, a series of cultural artifacts that emerged from their friendship that asserted a, a conflation of religious and anti-colonial historical threads in a way that very much presaged the Angkor Panorama Museum. So what I'll, I'll do in this talk is to try and read the Angkor Museum in light of Kim and Sihanouk's belief that the divergent uh, philosophical infrastructures of the North Korean and Cambodian states shared common ground in their proven resiliency against imperialist aggressors. While much of North Korea's overseas undertakings are portrayed as mere efforts to accumulate hard currency, the Angkor Museum, I think, might also be understood as a crystallization of post-colonial camaraderie. So scene one, Mansude Art Studio and the road to Temple City. So from exhibitions held in fraternal socialist countries in Eastern Europe in the 1950s to the opening of a gallery in Beijing's trendy 798 district in the late 2000s, North Korea's art industry has consistently maintained an international reach. Established in 1959, the Mansude Art Studio functions as the nexus of art production in North Korea and is responsible for nearly all works exported by Pyongyang. With a staff of some 1,000 art workers, the studio churns out an estimated 4,000 original pieces per year in media as varied as ink painting, bronze sculpture, and mosaic murals. Now, by far the most widely recognized examples of work carried out by the Overseas Projects Division of Mansude are the mon monuments and large-scale public constructions that the studio has designed and erected across Africa. Um, North Korea's artistic engagement with African nations dates to the 1970s, when Mansude constructed a youth and children's palace in Sudan, Kim Il-sung Stadium in Tanzania, and the Presidential Palace in Madagascar, among many other examples. And in the beginning, these buildings and monuments functioned to solidify relationships 
North Korea had formed with liberation movements in Africa, particularly those invested in the political project of the non-aligned movement. And at the time, North Korea considered these undertakings uh, political investments and sought no direct financial remuneration. Uh, Pyongyang was then pushing to gain admittance to the UN, and in the context of this pursuit, Kim Il-sung found gifting public sculptures um, a practical means of soliciting votes of support from African nations, many of whom had recently ascended to UN membership. And today, Mansude continues to accept work in Africa, although since 2000, nearly all such projects have come on a commission basis. While it's um, often assumed that Mansude receives a steady stream of contracts by virtue of cheap deep labor, Megan Kirkwood has pointed out that the, the studio's work is hardly inexpensive and frequently exceeds projected budgets. Uh, so examining the case of Namibia, which is um, one of Mansude's steadiest patrons, Kirkwood shows how um, oftentimes no other bidders have even been entertained uh, for a given project, indicating this, that the state harbors extra pecuniary motivations for awarding certain jobs to North Korea. And no doubt the kind of stylistic program North Korea is known for, monumental neoclassicism with um, over symbolic import, meets wide appeal among leaders and governments seeking to enlarge their image and magnify their authority. Now, with an eye towards extending its global profile beyond Africa, months today first approached Cambodia about constructing a museum in Siem Reap sometime in the late 2000s. The initial pitch met no favorable reception among Khmer authorities, however, as the prospective space would have given scarcely any consideration to the local context of Siem Reap or the historic Angkor sites that propel tourism to the city. Um, it would have instead focused on uh, North Korea's own culture and revolutionary history. And with this proposition rejected outright, North Korea then returned to the bar bargaining table and agreed to focus the proposed museum on Angkor, such that it would fit squarely within a, a recently launched tourism initiative concentrated on the area east of Siem Reap's Charles de Gaulle Avenue. And here the Mansude Museum would sit in the vicinity of the Asian traditional textile museum. And this is key, the Prince Norodom Sihanouk Museum. So, um, already from, from the initial planning stages, there was a, a proximity uh, between the site and the site dedicated to Sianu. And the singularity of the Angkor Panorama Museum vis-a-vis -vis Mansude's typical undertakings emerges from the terms of the agreed upon contract. So unlike the exportation of its other monoliths, uh, in which a league of Mansude artists would be dispatched to a given site and then um, called back to North Korea upon the completion of the assignment, uh, the Angkor Museum was envisioned as a long-term business partnership between North Korea and Cambodia. And Pyongyang agreed to finance the project up front, staff the museum with 20 North Korean employees and also resident artists who would maintain the panorama and receive all profits for the first 10 years of operation or until the initial investment had been recuperated. Thereafter, uh, North Korea would split the proceeds with Cambodia for 10 years before turning over all operations and subsequent profits to Khmer organizations. Running 24 million US dollars, the 6,000 square meter site took four years to complete. And although equipped with all the trappings of a, of a profit driven operation, the museum went beyond simply buttressing the lure of Angkor Archaeological Park. Uh, the space, I think, packs much of the diplomatic redolence that had characterized Mansude's gifted monuments in Africa. And this aspect comes to light when we consider the museum against the background of the brotherly camaraderie between Sihanouk and Kim Il-sung, a friendship that spawned a series of architectural, filmic, and textual productions by which the two leaders probed something of a middle way between their respective political and ideological tracks. So it seemed to comrades in arms. As the Cambodian and North Korean national anthems rang out in Siem Reap on December 4th, 2015, Cambodian uh, Deputy Prime Minister Sok An presided over a ribbon cutting ceremony to open the Angkor Panorama Museum. The occasion provided him an opportunity to underscore how the museum would not only contribute to the development of the Cambodian economy, but would also advance, advance the country's longstanding friendship 
and cooperation with North Korea. And this relationship he cited as having arisen from the deep personal accord shared by Prince Norodom Sihanouk and Kim Il-sung. So the two had uh, long been fellow travelers, at least since the inaugural meeting of the non-aligned movement in Belgrade in 1961, um, the historic event that officially established a, a constituency of nations seeking to dissociate themselves from the bipolar power dynamics of the Cold War. Their personal relationship would not take flight until 1965, however, when they attended a, a conference in Bandung held to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the historic 1955 Afro-Asian Conference. And according to Sihanou, the, um, during the event, Indonesian President Sukarno acted as a, a veritable matchmaker of strongmen within the movement, deliberately placing the Korean and Cambodian leaders in neighboring suites, uh, thinking that they would find much in common. By then, Sihanouk had all but secured the highest esteem in Kim's eyes, having broken off diplomatic ties with Seoul one year earlier in a move that effectively recognized the North as the legitimate Korea. In the years that followed, the friendship between the two would grow into an unshakable alliance. Now, to be sure, the two leaders were hardly in agreement on, on all scores, particularly in regards to the role of religion in their respective societies. So one of Sihanouk's most potent political adventures to date had involved revitalizing the standing of Buddhism in Cambodia. Um, he invoked religious heritage as a tool by which to unite the, the Cambodian people under a shared cultural lineage, all the while promoting a brand of socialism informed by Buddhist values. Um, these values he defined very elliptically, claiming Buddhism as not only the antithesis of common vices like dishonesty, um, thievery, deceit, and lying, but also the antagonistic forces in Marxist theory, namely the privileges of the upper class. As if to stress how Buddhist precepts might correspond with the agendas that underpin the non-aligned movement, um, he asserted, one often forgets that Buddha was a revolutionary, preaching in a, in a feudal society, love of one's neighbor, and equality among all living beings, or, According to the beautiful formula, men are judged by their actions. And then Kim, on the other hand, had followed the Soviets uh, in implementing a hardline campaign to weed out religion, deeming it a primitive superstition and a vestige of feudal society. While the singular Buddhist socialist framework elaborated by Sihanouk fell to the side of North Korea's staunchly anti-religious posture, uh, this aspect of the Cambodian leader's politics never deterred Kim Il-sung's support. Um, Kim confirmed as, confirmed as much through his response to a 1970 U.S.-backed coup helmed by Cambodian General Don Nol, uh, which forced Sihanouk's government into exile in Beijing. And according to Sihanouk, Kim promptly assured him that North Korea stood prepared to offer uh, full support for Cambodia's independence and its territorial integrity, a cause Kim no doubt saw as parallel to North Korea's own plight. And Sihanouk would remain in exile until 1975, during which time Kim Il-sung ordered the construction of a residence in North Korea reserved for the Cambodian prince. Situated along the base of Mount Daesong, just north of Pyongyang, uh, Jang Suwon Palace sits at some remove from the program of sites um, accessible to most foreign visitors to North Korea. Thus, the, the particulars of the building's design remain somewhat murky. Based on the scanned photographs um, and firsthand accounts of the structure, however, it appears that the building was envisioned as embodying Korean-Cambodian cultural ties through architectural form. And to this end, the palace's facade showcases features of traditional Korean architecture, most notably in the, the gently curved roof, while the overall layout obliquely mimics the general plan of Angkor Wat. Um, itself a kind of um, representational microcosm of the, the Hindu cosmos. And inside is encased a, a modern mansion comprising 40 rooms that were at the time of Sihanouk's tenancy staffed by some 100 North Korean employees and supplied with all forms of luxury. So Sihanouk would um, ultimately spend two prolonged periods at his North Korean red, uh, address and in one of the great many ironies of his career, um, he managed to return to Cambodia in 1975 by uh, collaborating with the Khmer Rouge, uh, the very organization that would soon after have him placed under house arrest while Pol Pot initiated a genocide that resulted in the murder of millions of Cambodians 
including five of Sihanouk's children. While the Kem when the Khmer Rouge was finally ousted from Cambodia in 1978, um, Sihanouk found little Chinese support for reinstalling his leadership and thus went into exile once again, this time from 1979 to 1991, uh, during which time he spent several months of each year in Pyongyang. And his stays in North Korea uh, prompted prodigious spells of creativity. Uh, not that this facet of his existence ever escaped his priorities, even in the most difficult of times. Uh, indeed, throughout his life, Sihanouk engaged in unapologetically eccentric, at times downright groovy means of expressing his affections for international allies. So he would even um, release a vinyl album of songs he had composed honoring solidarity with China North Korea, Vietnam, and Laos. So the, the North Korean composition titled Khmer Korean Friendship expresses the anti-imperialist sentiment he um, shared with Kim rhapsodizing. Oh dear Korean friends, we Khmers would not forget that you have always given our people infallible support. Your support greatly encourage us, encourages us in the fight we undertake against our enemy, US imperialism. And just as a kind of show and tell, um, I recently had the, the album digitized, so I thought I'd share just a brief clip of this song with you. Uh, this may be the first time it's ever been, been played publicly. Putting up in North Korea, Sihanouk's creative energy has found an outlet mainly in the channels of poetry and cinema. So he produced at least four films in North Korea between 1988 and 1991. And naturally, Korean actors play the, the vast majority of the characters in these works, and the dialogue is almost entirely in Korean with English subtitles. Uh, of Sihanouk's North Korean films, um, the one called I Shall Never For I Shall Never See You Again, Oh My Beloved, Kampuchea or Cambodia uh, of 1991 touches most immediately upon the brand of anti-imperialism sponsored by Kim and Sihanouk. It's set in the fictional Southeast Asian country of Amna, and it, it spins a tale that centers around a marital relationship between Li Dok, which you see, uh, who you see here on the right, um, who's the Prince of Amna, and Botum, the daughter of the Cambodian king, who is his first wife. Um, I say first wife because this is a, a polyamorous court um, and a hierarchical one. So his second wife is um, named Ti Ben, uh, who is from Amna. And the fact that a Cambodian um, is her son's first wife is just um, uh, the most embarrassing thing to Lidok's mother, the queen of Amna. And in order to rectify the situation, she decides that the best course of action would be to um, annex Cambodia um, for, for the sole purpose of elevating the, the Amna wife uh, to the first wife. So Botum learns of this imperialist plot after performing her Cambodian national identity uh, before the royal court. And she performs what's called an Apsara dance. So it, um, references to apsaras or female spirits that have uh, supernatural powers of seduction can be found throughout Angkor Wat and developed into the royal ballet um, and now have kind of left the court and, and uh, become a sort of tourist spectacle as well. Um, but in the film then we have a North Korean actress uh, performing the apsara dance uh, just as she's about to learn of her, her country's um, uh, annexation. So we'll watch just a brief clip.
so when she learns uh, of the, the plot against Cambodia, she just decides to escape Amna with her son, Chantreya, and they eventually get caught um, at the border with Laos, and um, she receives a death sentence. And then Lee Dok um, is just mortified um, at the death of his wife, and so he decides to send the son, Chantreya, to Cambodia. Um, and so this is kind of the climatic moment of the film where the child turns into this um, almost kind of revolutionary figure. Um, when he reaches the border, he, he expresses his, um, his will when he grows up to join the anti-imperialist forces against Amna. And in this clip, um, Sihanouk makes an appearance himself welcoming the child back to Cambodia. Kambodia 나는 안남을 미워한다. 이 세상에 하나밖에 없는 어머니의 목숨까지 빼앗고 나를 쫓아버린 안남이 내 나라일 수 없다. 오늘부터 나는 캄보다의 아들이다. 내 코소. So no doubt the the figure of this precocious revolutionary in many ways um, mirrors the kind of figures that Sianu and Kim saw themselves uh, uh, as embodying or the role that they saw themselves as performing. And each of these, uh, these associations had in fact been forecasted at the outset of the film through a series of still images showing the architectural complex at Bayon, uh, one of the chief building achievements of the 13th century Angkorian king, Jayavarman VII. And these shots zoom in on the Bayon's signature towers, each of which features four faces peering out in the cardinal directions. The, the identity of these now iconic faces has been the subject of extensive speculation. And there have been arguments that they represent uh, particular Buddhist, Buddhist deities, um, the um, Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, and other claims that they're supposed to function as self-portraits of Jayavarman VII. And in this context, and in the context of the film, however, consensus appears to congeal around the idea that the faces simultaneously reference the Buddhist religious heritage of Cambodia and the anti-imperialist will of a powerful leader. And Mansude Overseas Project would in fact foreground the Bayan Temple complex to similar ends in the Angkor Panorama Museum that we'll turn to now. So scene three, the inner sanctum. Um, the, the first segment of the panorama is titled Defense Strategy. And to give you a sense of the rhetoric North Korea used to frame the narrative, um, the museum website described this portion as, quote, vividly portraying heroic fighting scenes of the Khmer people who had repelled foreign aggressors to defend their love for the fatherland and national dignity. It also depicts the General Jayavarman VII, the greatest king who had rallied the Khmer nation and smashed the Champa forces. So a, a bit of context is necessary to unpack the reference here. Um, little can be said for certain about the life of Jayavarman VII as early Khmer history is derived almost entirely from temple inscriptions and the majority of them are written in um, overtly panegyric tone. The narrative that has become associated with the king, however, casts him as a great liberator, primarily in view of his role in reclaiming Angkor following its overthrow by Cham uh, invaders. So before becoming king, he had traveled to Champa to convene with an ally sometime around 1165, during which time political turmoil broke out back in Angkor as the sitting king was killed by a Khmer dignity, dignitary. Subsequently, the ruler of the Cham kingdom launched an invasion of, of the Angkor capital, overtaking it in 1177. Uh, Jayavarman VII, who had um, in the interim return to Angkor, then led an army against the invading Choms and eventually took the throne himself. 
So like Chantre Chantrea in Sihanouk's 1991 film, this account of the emancipation of Angkor entails a dramatic return from abroad, one that recalls Kim Il-sung's triumphal return to Pyongyang in, in October 1945 after leading, leading the guerrilla forces that are said to have liberated Korea from Japanese colonizers. And this, no doubt, um, Sihanouk also saw himself as um, potentially participating in this kind of narrative upon his return to Cambodia. And we should also note that Jayavarma in the seventh reputation as a liberator dates to his childhood and, and links up with this Buddhist faith. So he um, actually had little to do with the construction of Angkor Wat, which was completed earlier in the 12th century as a Hindu temple under the reign of Surya Varma II. He did, however, substitute Buddhism in place of Hinduism as the official religion of Angkor. And Angkor Wat in turn became a Buddhist temple and underwent significant changes accordingly. And an inscription pertaining to the king's early life links his Buddhist faith to his role as an unparalleled liberator, uh, reading, the supreme king of kings having acquired the knowledge by himself in the city uh, Jaya Yapura wanted to liberate those who are plunged in the ocean of unhappiness. Uh, he was like Sada Doni, Doni uh, Gautama Buddha in the, in the city of Sakyas, a savior not only from colonizers, but all forms of unhappiness. The soon to be Buddhist king here comes across as one whose religious devotion dovetails with his nationalist commitments. And this is really the narrative that the Panorama Museum perpetuates. So continuing with the narrative of Angkor's liberation, then the next segment of the Mansu Day panorama takes us to the period immediately after the crowning of the king. So it's called Construction Strategy. And according to the museum website, it again impressively portrays the process of construction of the Khmer Empire with the image of Jayavarman VII, who is enthroned as the king after the liberation of Angkor and the building of the Bayon Temple. And we see here how the construction of the Bayon Temple, you see it against the horizon in the background, um, just as we saw in Sihanouk's 1991 film, is given central importance. So one thing I wanted to, to say is that in writing on this, this temple in particular, there's a long string of uh, very dramatic accounts by archaeologists and explorers upon first finding this site unexpectedly uh, long before its restoration. So in 1912, Pierre Loti, a, a French novelist and naval officer, um, described his experience coming upon the face towers as, um, I looked up at the tree-covered towers which dwarfed me when all of a sudden my blood curdled as I saw an enormous smile looking down on me, and then another smile over on another wall, then three, then five, then ten, peering from every direction. I was being observed from all sides. So I think in this description, we get a sense of how these images uh, at least have the potential to create the sense that one is coming under the panoptic gaze. And I think that this is a major reason why the Mansu Day artists put um, so much emphasis on this particular site as opposed to Angkor Wat, uh, precisely because it can be read as a kind of originary leader portrait, anticipating the ubiquity of images of the Kim leaders throughout North Korea and the sense of the leader being always everywhere present. And by the same token, when the museum website references the image of Jayavarman the seventh, it's not only referencing the portrayal of his enthronement, literally, I think, but also the faces of the Bayon Temple, uh, with the scene as a whole illustrating a, a ver veritable deification of the newly crowned king. Finally, the third section of the panorama is titled Prosperity. And here we find that the Khmer Empire has become a mysterious and gorgeous civilization on the vast Angkor Plain. And it's actually here that we see Angkor Wat for the first time, um, shrouded in, in mist in the background. And what's remarkable about, remarkable about the sequencing is that Angkor Wat, um, despite being the earlier structure, only becomes visible after we encounter the Bayon in the context of the great liberation of Angkor from foreign invaders. So anyone familiar with the foundational historical narrative that North Korea perpetuates we'll see parallels between this progression in the panorama and the historical phases um, that, that really structure North Korean histor historical accounts, Japanese colonization of Korea from 1910 to 1945, 
followed by the liberation of, of Korea by Kim Il-sung, including the so-called victorious fatherland liberation war or the Korean War, followed by reconstruction and the glorious rise up from the ashes. So Mansude essentially pressed Cambodian history into the same formula um, so as to create an impression of history as a, really a recursive teleology wherein a powerful leader returns from abroad as a messianic figure to overthrow the colonizers and lead the country to prosperity. And there's many parallels that we could talk about as well with the kind of panorama that um, North Korea um, Mansude Art Studio again installed in the Victorious Fatherland Liberation War Museum in Pyongyang. It's again a cyclorama that um, is 360 degrees. And um, uh, the story really centers around one particular battle of Daejeon in which North Korea is in this account portrayed as liberating the South. And so we here see the South Koreans liberated and are um, you know, giving thanks to the North Korean troops by um, sort of hoisting up this portrait of Kim Il-sung. So I wanna close by saying that you know, Sihanouk has been extensively criticized for the attention that he gave to filmmaking all throughout his political career while Cambodians across the country faced dire circumstances. And it's easy to see him as retreating from his political responsibilities uh, into this kind of hobby. But I think there's something more going on that links Sihanouk's preoccupation with cinema to the worldview espoused by the North Korean state. So it's been said that North Korean ideology essentially uh, turns Marx on his head, right? And positing that ideas are really what drive history and affect change as opposed to material conditions. And I think for both Sihanouk and Mansude Art Studio, the arena of this, the aesthetic becomes a way of working out and articulating ideas with an eye to changing the world around us, however naive. In the case of the Angkor Museum, this is a realm of ideas where religious cultural inheritance presents as raw material to be radically molded in conformity with a, a particular vision of the future. The sacred and the socialist merge under the banner of anti-imperialist nationalism. And I think at its heart, it's meant, really meant as a message of, of hope that yes, you may now be under the weight of uh, the colonial enterprise, but the light will come, right? At the same time, as the museum's now permanently locked doors attest, this contrived interpretation of history required a leap of faith that in the end, few were willing to take. Thank you so much. Wow, Douglas, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I learned a lot. And in fact, we have a lot of questions. But before we get to the questions, brace yourself, Douglas. You got to get ready for this. Uh, I have one question, and then I'll uh, go to the Q&A box and read off some of the questions there so that you can answer them. And then after the Q&A box, um, we will try something new, and that is allow you folks, uh, the attendees, to verbally ask Douglas questions. Okay, so we'll try this. It's a new format that we're experimenting here. My question is, right off the bat, uh, as you presented and showed the museum, uh, you showed the windy hallways. Yeah. Uh, this is really fascinating. And my question is, was that purposely designed in that way and if it was purposely designed for what purpose right why why was it so windy and the reason i ask is when i went to pyongyang and went to the uh well their version of the korean war museum uh, the fatherland liberation Father, victorious fatherland <laughs> liberation <laughs> museum i believe it's grand it's huge and it's beautiful and there are trenches to uh sort of recreate that wartime feel yeah. and the museum itself, as you walk through it, 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 there's this sense of being immersed into that history and the storytelling from all sides. Um, it's absolutely uh, breathtaking. So was there a purpose to the windy hallways? I, I think so actually, because, um, you know, it's, it's striking how um, much it reminds me of when I was, uh, researching a number of years ago on the Pyongyang metro system, um, something that I kept finding in uh, commentary of, 
of people who had, had visited and described their experience was um, the, the seemingly unnecessary like walkways. Um, there's all these kind of turns that you need to take in order to actually get to um, the station where the, the thematic program comes into view. And I really thought, you know, um, after visiting there, I think it really does serve a, a kind of phenomenological experiential function, mostly in creating anticipation of something. I really think that North Korean museums um, try to capitalize on that, um, that feeling that you will get when, um, you know, you step into the, the, um, the space suddenly opens up onto this vista of, of images and you're really supposed to be um, completely engulfed in the, the environment, right? So I think it's all about like funneling you into that. Great, thank you. Um, right, so we got a question from Sarah Velas. If I'm mispronouncing your name, please forgive me. Uh, the question is, the Cambodian friendship album you shared, which uh, Shino made is fascinating. You showed us the English translation lyrics of the song. Does the album, also include the lyrics in Korean and Khmer. Uh, Khmer. Uh, was the album exclusively, exclusively for Cambodian Korean friendship or involved other friendship countries? Um, yeah, so, well, a couple of things. So the, the lyrics that I showed were like from um, an online archive of Sihanouk materials. Um, they're not actually included in the album at all, um, but, yeah, so it's it's a it's for let's see we have China, North Korea, Vietnam, um, and Laos represented here, and the um, the lyrics they change from Khmer uh, actually to Korean within the course of the song. Um, you know the I have I, I don't speak Khmer, so I have to check if it's like just a repetition uh, in Korean or or what, but um, yeah, so it's, it's something that, it's a it's an entirely polylingual album. So um, yeah, so if anyone's interested in hearing the, the other tracks, I, I have them, so just email me and I, I'd be happy to like, get some input from, from people who study these other countries. Great, and Miriam Stark asks, why did the museum close? Yeah, okay, so this was a big question of, of mine. My assumption was that it was because of the UN sanctions, um, because in, I think January, early January, 2020, Cambodia had to, to demonstrate that it was complying with the UN. So um, I was really devastated because the North Korean restaurants had to close. Um, they're like my favorite places in the world, um, but uh, they suffered from, from that. So I assumed it was the same thing, but when I talked to, um, people in the Cambodian tourist industry, they thought it was unrelated to that. Um, it was just simply a financial failure. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, it was kind of relatively expensive to enter. So it cost um, 12 US dollars for foreigners to get in, which, you know, it's not, you know, maybe not that much compared to museums, museum, say in the US, but, um, in Cambodia, it's, it's like the same price that you would pay for the Angkor National Museum, which is much bigger and takes, you know, much longer to, to go through it and like actual um, um, uh, sort of artifacts and such on view. So I think it, that was a deterrent. Um, North Korea, well, they did actually offer um, the cheaper price for local uh, Khmer populations, but um, they wanted to kind of rope the museum admission price into the whole of Angkor Wat. So, you know, in order to buy the ticket to Angkor Wat, you would also buy the ticket to this museum, which would have been more um, you know, kind of guarantee income. But yeah, so the people I talked to just said that the, um, we don't have the exact figures, but just the, um, it, it was just simply not patronized as much as they would have, would have hoped. Um, Diane McHale asks, did the North Koreans have anything to do with the architecture in uh, Phnom Penh, uh, like the statue of Norodom Sinok? Yeah, that's a good question. That I actually don't know. Um, you know, it would make sense, but I've never, I haven't come across any evidence of that. And currently, what is the relationship between North Korea, Cambodia, South Korea, and Cambodia? Do you know? I mean, it's very strained right now because um, you know, Cambodia 
they really held out, I think, as long as they could to like keep some North Korean establishments going um, in Phnom Penh, Siem Reap. Uh, but, you know, ultimately under the pressure of the sanctions, there's just very um, little, you know, I, I don't know about the necessarily the high, the relationship of high politics, but certainly the, uh, any kind of cultural expression of relationships between North Korea and Cambodia um, are very much uh, non-existent anymore, which it's, um, I think, as I said, I think it's unfortunate because the, the question asked about South Korea and of, of all North Korean restaurants that I've ever been to, the one in Phnom Penh was the most populated by South Koreans, just simply overflowing uh, with that in a massive site. And so it was just really remarkable to see that kind of um, uh, engagement on the ground between North and South Koreans. And the museum, I think, might have at least had the potential to offer something um, in, in the same direction. So, um, yeah, so it, it had like, they tried to make it kind of uh, more like a meeting spot too by opening up a ginseng cafe in it as well. Um, and yeah, but even like perusing the museum website, there are, you know, there are moments where, you know, when you look at the, the drop down list of the languages, um, it'll be like um, English, uh, uh, Khmer, but then Joseno. Uh, and so it's, it's, um, there's, there's a marker of the, the North South division in the museum too. And so these kind of sites, I think, are always very interesting to see how they actually play out. Um, yeah. This question is from SC. How does this DPRK patronage of Buddhist religion compare or relate with DPRK's patronage of religion domestically. Yeah, so it's, um, yeah, this, so that's what I'm, I'm very interested in and looking at, I think more going forward. Um, so domestically, a lot of times, um, I mean, just to give like a very basic sense, um, a lot of times the, um, say, Buddhist sculptures and monuments are described as being almost this kind of, um, rude and raw primal scene of exploitation, wherein um, the makers of these objects are exploited by um, those who are, who are ordering them or something. Um, but nevertheless, their um, brilliant uh, aesthetic sensibility comes to shine through. Um, so, you know, there's a, a very strong um, nationalist impulse, of course, throughout all of it. And it's not very surprising in that regard. Um, yeah, so what I've been interested in is with the Cambodian case, it's um, one of the few times where I've seen North Korea really try to um, wrap world history into its uh, um, um, narrative structures. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's, it makes me think also, you do, I do actually find some descriptions uh, or like kind of um, summary descriptions of Angkor Wat in North Korean cultural journals. Um, in usually there's like some sections devoted to like world heritage or something. And, you know, it, it's interesting because in um, North Korean conventions, you know, it's, it's expected that you're going to quote one of the leaders usually in the opening um, paragraph in bold font. And so for that one, uh, for the Angkor articles, it's um, usually a quote from Kim Jong-il about how, um, every nation needs to develop it, its own um, aesthetic that, that meets it, its own circumstances and such. And so um, I think in this case, it, it's a projection of that, that um, this is a uniquely Cambodian phenomenon, but it still is um, related to the, the kind of narratives that, that North Korea is interested in, in um, constructing. I'm going to combine two questions together, one from Sylvia Nam and the other one from Audrey Kachsor. Uh, how was the Mansude eight? How was Mansude able to build the museum in face of UN sanctions? And uh, can you speak more about the aesthetic of the panorama as it relates to the aesthetic of the political program of socialist realism in North Korea? Okay, sure. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so I think the, the building of it, um, I did not get any sense that there was any problem um, with this 
uh, so this would be going back to um, 2012. I, I'm, I'm trying to think of what the, the status of the sanctions were um, at that point. But uh, yeah, I don't think that there was really any um, concern that that was going to be um, you know, flying in the face of, of the, the UN um, or, or really have any consequences. But then, you know, now that it's been built, the main problem was actually having North Korean employees living um, on the premises or, or in the vicinity and in, in Cambodia, like having a visa, right? And actually um, um, earning hard currency from it. So that, that was the main thing. And the, the other thing was that North Korea financed it, the museum too. So it wasn't, they weren't receiving, they were taking a loss here actually. Um, so it was really working against them in that respect. Um, yeah, so the aesthetic of it, you know, so something in the, that comes up a lot in the descriptions is that there's so much emphasis on um, the sheer number of figures um, that are in some of these uh, works. I think it's like 44,000 uh, figures are displayed or something like that. Um, so I really think that it, it really is about uh, making a, a distinction between um, a deified leader um, who stands out from this uh, mass of people that are virtually indistinguishable uh, from one another. So that, that's one thing that um, comes to mind. You know, I, what's interesting to me though about the panorama is that um, there's so much going on in it, but when you see it, you really don't look at that much because the light, it, it's a very theatrical, um, theatrical size production where, um, you know, things are usually sort of spotlighted and the sound also is corresponding with that very particular uh, moment in the scene. So, uh, you know, usually I, I think of that socialist, picture, socialist realist pictures are oftentimes doing a lot more than um, the narrative substance implied by the title. Um, in this case, it's, it, it's a really uh, contrived effort to um, get you to not look at other parts or until in a certain sequence, right? So um, there's, it, it's a, yeah, I think I would say a very much more directed way of, of looking. So it's hard for me to even compare this to um, other socialist realist images just because the viewing experience is so different. It, and it's, you're also getting like shuttled in there. And then once the, the program is done, you're like, okay, you're time to move on to the, the 4D movie theater, right? So it's not like there's not going to be sustained engagement with it. Yeah, so it's, it's like the Korean War Museum in Pyongyang. Yeah. It's vast and it's, it's really detailed, um, almost like finding Waldo, where are you? And it's just, yeah, it's really there, right? Yeah. Yeah, my uh, brother, the guide told me that it would take four days to see the entire museum. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned, this is Christina, uh, you mentioned North Korean artists living at the site. Yeah. Can you talk okay. a little more about that? Yeah. Sure. Um, so actually what was interesting to me, some of these artists, um, the ones who were based permanently there to like kind of keep up, uh, like uh, repainting certain things that needed to uh, maintenance. Um, yeah, they would be on there on site um, living, uh, either, I'm not sure there or on some compound. Um, it's, it's very similar to how the, the Korean restaurants operate. Um, but, and, and in this case, it was actually very similar to, um, I showed an image early on of the uh, studio and gallery that Mansude opened in Beijing. And there, um, there's three to five resident artists um, living and working there, producing work that's sold in the gallery on site. And when I visited there in 2015, one of them had actually just come back from uh, Cambodia, came from Cambodia after working on this. And it was interesting, like some of the paintings that he was making were of um, uh, Cambodian children and um, the kind of paintings that would have been sold um, at the Encore site as well. Um, so it's, I'm, I'm not sure like what the process is or what kind of ranking you have to have in Mansude to um, be sent abroad and to work. Um, may not even be possible right now with the sanctions, but um, previously anyway. Um, yeah, so when I, I, I got to have um, like lunch and coffee with them, but they were very reticent and like hesitant to, to say much, um, except, um, 
you know, just m more just kind of very innocuous um, things about pro process and, and that, and just like making small talk. But uh, still, it, it, it seemed like there was a relationship that uh, they used artists who were already going to be abroad to do this museum. Uh, this question is from Michael Van. Uh, what did the Cambodian nationalists, how did they respond and react to this North Korean project? Yeah, um, I, I'm not sure about the Cambodian nationalists per se. I, I can't say I'm um, that attuned to, to Cambodian um, contemporary politics and like the kind of viewpoint that uh, one would have for this kind of museum. Um, the museum obviously did come under a lot of um, criticism particularly because it was a profit driven um, enterprise. It's not like the monuments that you can see where there's no, you're not like paying money for it. Um, there was a, a kind of ethical dimension, I think, to um, handing over currency to, to North Korea, essentially. Um, that, that's the main thing that, the main kind of troubling factor that um, I've seen in any of the, the accounts and responses to it. Right, so Shannon asks, can you explain a little bit more about the meaning and the importance of the huge smiling Buddha at the entrance and how that plays into the common ground and relations between North Korea and Cambodia? Oh, right, okay, so the smiling Buddha, it comes from the Bayon temple of the smiling faces um, that are facing in, in the cardinal directions. And um, like I said, there, there's really, um, just mountains of, uh, of writing, especially from like French archeologists on um, really trying to figure out and nail down the, um, the iconographic uh, program and signification of it. So I hesitate to say like exactly what it represents, but I find like um, North Korea is kind of interesting in that they make zero attempt to explain um, the faces or the, what icon, um, what kind of symbolic function they would have. It's, it's simply, um, you know, it's, I think it was titled like Smile of Peace or something. So it's, it's really another way that I think North Korea treats history in sort of interesting ways um, by deliberately not trying to contextualize it and making this, it this kind of uh, seemingly universal um, uh, symbol or, or uh, interface, right? I'm going to ask one more question from the Q&A, and if I have not asked your question, we'll open it up and uh, you can verbalize your question. A lot of times what I try to do is I try to group the questions together because a lot of questions overlap, right? So I try to do that. If I did not specifically ask your question, perhaps uh, during the, uh, uh, the other Q&A, you can verbalize your question. Okay, this one's coming from Daphne Zero, all the way from sunny California. Thank you for a fantastic, oh, sorry. I, I would love to hear how this presentation fits into your larger research. Are you setting out to illuminate different ways in which the North Koreans apply Marxism, turning it on its head, as you said? Or is your project an intervention into North Korea's relations with its allies? Or, are you illuminating internal contradictions in its reconciliation of different ideologies? Um, yeah, so uh, thank you so much. Um, I think all of those come into play. Um, I would say the, uh, the second one is maybe a little bit less uh, of interest in this particular project, because this is really the only one that, that looks beyond um, the, the Korean Peninsula, um, thus far at least, I may change. Um, as I said, it's very uh, preliminary, but yeah. So one thing that really um, runs throughout all of, at anything I do on North Korea is to at least to be aware of internal contradictions, right? And I think in many ways, in many cases, um, you know, we, there's say ideological contradictions and um, idiosyncrasies are run rampant in North Korea. Um, rhetoric and um, historical texts and such. And I think in many cases, artists are um, tasked with coming, uh, creating some kind of uh, reconciliation of uh, various viewpoints and such. Um, yeah, so that's something that I think I would say is like a methodological angle. Um, but yeah, so the, the mm, general direction of the project though looks at how um, North Korea 
kind of wants to have it both ways to celebrate uh, certain examples of cultural heritage in, in Korea and then also in this case abroad, um, whilst really pressing it into the mold um, that, that it's comfortable with. Okay. Uh, thank you. And now we're going to open it up to the floor. Um, if, I, if I might uh, say, I think we also had um, uh, someone mentioned in the comment that they had actually been to the museum. Uh, so please feel free to speak up. It'd be great to uh, hear your own reflections on, on this. Right. Um, there seems to be a number of people who actually visited the site. So it would be interesting to hear their experience as well. Mike Goodman. I guess one of the questions, and I think a few others had this also, is there any link available anywhere to this uh, recording of the album of Sihanouk's songs? Yeah, um, it's not, there's no link. Um, I just had it like digitized from the vinyl last week. Um, so if there, actually, if there's interest, then maybe I'll, I'll, um, let me think about what the best like platform it may, I guess YouTube, but um, I, I can post it for sure. Um, otherwise, if you don't see it in the near future, um, or if you want it now, just um, look up my email on the GWIX page. I'm happy to send you the, um, the tracks. Okay, great, thanks. All right, next one is from Chen Chi Huang. I was visiting uh, Phnom Penh uh, no, sorry, Siem Reap, I think in 2016 with a Chinese tour group. Uh, the itinerary of the tour group didn't include that museum. I think that's partly why it's not very ses financially successful because a whole bunch of tourists are Chinese group tourists, but th that museum was, I think, not included in most of their Chinese group itineraries. Yeah. I managed to visit that museum at one uh, at the end of the day, during one day of the trip. It is kind of a very interesting experience. Uh, the paranormal painting is really very, very, in, very impressive. Uh, and it's, I think, at least comparable to the paranormal painting in the Gettysburg Museum in near Washington, D.C. But the interesting thing is that uh, I remember the lady or the gentleman selling ticket at the entrance he or she was a North Korean, but the photographer taking picture of you inside the panorama room, he was actually a Cambodian. Hmm. Uh, they didn't allow you to take pictures yourself inside the panorama, but if you pay $10, uh, there will be a photographer who take quite good picture of you. Another interesting thing is that after my visit, it was already pitch dark outside. So that area is completely dark by 7 p.m. or 7.30. Uh, I was having difficulty finding a way back to my hotel. Yeah. Then the photographer just came out of the museum and asked whether I would like to ride on his motorbike. And I just asked, how much should I pay you for the ride? And he just said, whatever you want. So I ended up paying him $3 for a ride from the museum to my hotel. And I just asked him, uh, how much did he make working for the museum? He said that it's around $10 a day. So another location in Siem Reap is the North Korean restaurant. Have you been there? Um, not to the one in Siem Reap, but the one in Phnom Penh. The, the one in Siem Reap is just across the street to my hotel. So I was able to eat there two or three times during my visit. Yeah. I've been to quite a few North Korean restaurants in different parts of the world. The one in Siem Reap, because at that time, North Korea was conducting a lot of nuclear tests or missile tests, so there were say, very strict sanctions. South Koreans are not encouraged to visit the restaurants, right. so the business was very poor. I was able to have a very long dialogue with one of the ladies working there on a one-to-one -one basis. So there's no one else, just that lady and me. We were talking in simple English and Chinese because she was trying to learn Chinese. So I was able to have a long talk with her. <laughs> That's quite unique among different restaurants sure. of North Korea in the world. 
No, I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned also um, the Gettysburg uh, panorama because, you know, one thing I, I didn't, I forgot to mention this, is that um, it's striking just how antiquated this format is. Um, you know, I think it's heyday, the panorama's heyday was what, in early 20th century maybe? Um, but, you know, uh, who is still making panoramas anymore, but North Korea really holds on to this, um, you know, and the, the more like updated technology in the museum, like the, the movie theater is more of an ancillary uh, function. Um, so it, I think it really it is important, um, uh, the, just how impressive the amount of work that goes into it is. Um, you know, like I said, I mentioned the, the number of figures and such, and, you know, North Korea, I think, a lot of times also uh, will stress the number of artists that participate in on a project, like, you know, over a hundred on this particular uh, mural or something. And, and it really um, kind of feeds into the idea that, um, yes, there are all these people working on there and yet it's impossible to tease out different styles or anything, right? Um, it, it is a collaborative um, collective enterprise in the, the strictest sense. Right. Is like mass games. We used to do that in China quite often, but we don't do it anymore in China these days. But they still they're still doing that in North Korea. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of questions from our participants, so we'll try to get through it. Uh, next person is Anne Anne Bung. Hello. Hi, Doug. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, I have a question about uh, museum practice and museum history. I guess. Uh, I, I yesterday I just went to uh, Professor David Droslitz's talk and he has a new book about heritage and debt, art and globalism. And uh, there's a lot of interest in how um, museums are these kind of bastage, or, or at least the Euro-American encyclopedic museum is institutions for these kind of imperialist pasts and how do new museum practices deal with kind of post-colonial questions. And um, I was struck by how, and there's a lot of interest in the global South and uh, David Joseph's main example is the Singapore National Gallery. I don't know if you heard about it. And I, I always feel like, um, and he's interested in moments when things are syn synchronic, but not contemporary. And I feel like this example you're talking about and the Singapore National Gallery is exactly like synchronically happening, mm -hmm. but not contemporary. And I was just wondering, um, how do you see your work uh, critiquing or engaging with this kind of new studies about museum discourse because it's very much a Soviet model of museums that this panorama museum is engaging with which doesn't really uh, it comes from but it's, it's different from Euro-American encyclopedic museums with private collectors and a lot of capital. Thank you. Yeah um, so I think it's um, it's certainly Yes, certainly from that model in the sense that it is um, such a, a didactic uh, program, but then also it, it's, it seems to me like um, a really a, a combination of the, the classic model of the Soviet Museum, but um, made like hyper kitsch um, as a way to present it itself as contemporary. Um, and so, you know, I I find this museum like actually quite vacuous in terms of the, the meaning that it tries to um, convey. I think it, it, it tries to convey more a general sense of, uh, of history as involving, uh, like I said, the, uh, the, the, the position of the leader or the importance of the leader as, um, as a revolutionary emancipator and more than actually imparting any sort of uh, particular information about objects that you're going to see later at the, the temple complexes or anything. Um, so yeah, I, I can't say I'm quite sure how it would um, line up with say the, the Singapore Museum or um, this, this interest in cultural heritage um, that, that David Drossel is in, but um, certainly we'll, we'll keep it in mind. Thank you so much. All right, the next question comes from Diane McHale. Diane? Yeah, my question is getting back to Buddhism and I, I had one comment and then the question. And so I did not go to the panoramic because like many people, I was like, 
what pay more money but yeah. i did go to the other museum in cm the the one the national one yes. and i remember there was this huge room of buddhist yeah hall figures. of a thousand buddhas or, yeah right which i felt was sort of emphasizing we're a buddhist country you're going to go look at a hindu temple but we're a buddhist country but getting back to um the panorama one of the things it seemed like the only Buddhist thing in there was this sort of bayan thing. Yeah. That, that was how Buddhism was coming in. And I was wondering if there were other ways in which, any other ways in which they were trying to use Buddhism to go with nationalism, but also if when North Koreans and um, Cambodians are, are creating these artistic imagery, they, they actually have different kinds of Buddhism and does that matter? So there's my questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, thank you so much. Um, you know, it's, it's something I'll, I'll continue to think about, but um, just on this, my impression at least, is that really the um, Buddhism um, in its entirety is really getting um, uh, encapsulated in the Bayon Temple in this, okay. uh, in this, this instance. Um, yeah, precisely because it, it, it starts to, it allows North Korea to construct the kind of narratives that, that it's interested in. Um, yeah, so there's not really actually much um, reference to this, but it, it, it is, I think, another reason why uh, the King Jayavarman VII is stressed um, because of his role in changing the national religion. And I think it... Um, North Korea is at least less concerned with the, you know, what, I, what religion was, it was changing to as much as the sense that um, a new epoch is beginning, right? Um, and this, yeah, this, this end of uh, what was and this beginning of a new history. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Jungir's Hong. So, um, I think you mentioned it before uh, about the closing of the museum. You weren't uh, sure if it was a UN sanction or the financial problems that it was facing. But with that in regards, um, is there a possibility for the museum to reopen again? Um, and if so, like, what kind of problems do you think that they need to settle first in order to do so? Um, yeah, so there, you know, certainly is, I think, um, because... Um, right now, it's sort of under the uh, what control of um, Apsara Authority. Uh, it's a long acronym, but uh, uh, the organization that, that is really involved in um, maintenance of, of the sites, um, including this one. And um, they would be the one that would have to, to really spearhead the reopening of it. But, you know, I think well, right now is tourism effectively shut down. Uh, it's really hard for me to imagine that occurring, but yes, there would, there would need to be a demonstrated demand for um, this kind of museum to, to reopen. Um, I'm not especially hopeful, even though uh, if it were up for me, uh, we'd open the doors tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Sam Swash. Sam? Hi, Douglas. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I've just started studying for a PhD at the University of Central Lancashire here in the UK. Um, I'm researching North Korean death culture and the Kum Suzanne Palace of the Sun. So I was just wondering if your project has or will look at the mausoleum at all. And also, just a quick one, where can we keep up to date with your research? Do you have a Twitter account or anything? Thank um, you. Um, yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Um, OK, so for the mausoleum, yeah. Um, I haven't really um, found a way to, to work it into this project yet, but um, it did come into play when I worked on the Pyongyang Metro because one of the stations that's uh, permanently closed down is uh, in the immediate vicinity of the mausoleum. Um, and so it, it kind of raises questions about, you know, what is this, um, uh, was this decision to limit mobility through that particular area or uh, what's going on with with that kind of relationship above and underground um, yeah and so that that's the most I've engaged with it um, it's certainly a fascinating place um, again another one of these these places like the 
uh, Victoria's Fatherland Liberation War Museum, where you kind of get shuttled through this this maze of rooms and artifacts that seem never ending, um, and yet you know you're never able to really um, um, like stop and look at anything. Too, it's like always on to the next thing, right? So this cumulative experience. I, I really think there there is a particular kind of phenomenology that that is is um, proper to to North Korean museums and. Um, sites like these. Um, yeah, as far as the um, keeping up with my research, well, thank you so much for um, wanting to, um, but probably the academia.edu um, site is the best one. If you just search me, it probably should come up one of the first ones. I try to post everything I write there. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, Sylvia Nam. No. Hi, thanks so much for the fascinating talk. Um, I had the chance to visit the museum back in 2016 and I got to talk to both the deputy CEO on the Cambodian side, um, Mr. Yit and uh, the North Korean side. I don't know if he's still the, the deputy CEO, but it was, a, it was an interesting conversation. And part of it, um, when you talked about this melting of the sacred and the socialist, one of the other things that I thought was intention is like translation across like geography and nationalist culture. Uh, and so the image that you showed of the Namibia Museum, yeah. modernist, I think that's originally the way that the North Koreans wanted to build this museum. They yeah. wanted it to be highly modern and the Cambodians said, no, you actually have to make it look as Khmer as possible. And so the, the way that the architecture of the museum looks is very much an intervention from the Cambodian side. And then similarly, uh, I think that the, in the, what, he, what they had told me was that in the uh, original depictions of the, you know, these Khmer warriors in the panorama that the Cambodian side had to intervene regularly to say that the faces did not look Cambodian enough. And so in this sort of melding of the sacred and the socialist are these sorts of understandings of nationalism and how that also gets translated through this, uh, through like a, a back and forth, which I thought uh, it, it is a good, uh, your, your framing it very much was evocative of that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I think a lot of the, at least the, the Cambodia and um, um, news articles and stuff that came out around the opening really stressed that I, I, team uh, of Cambodian consultants was involved in in giving recommendations and in, in approving the um, the plan and the execution of it and yeah thank you for mentioning the the architecture as well because you know when I, I went there specifically looking for this museum and I was like sort of unsure what building it was because um, around this area now the there's so many buildings that have this almost this exact same profile um, and style and you know some of them are like banquet halls and such um, and so were it not for this uh, kind of conspicuous banner outside I, I would not have like known that oh this is, must be the North Korean um, uh, museum. All right uh, it looks like we have oh we have Mike Goodman asking another question repeat customer. Okay. Oh, yeah, thanks. I was just curious, uh, did uh, or does the panorama offer any explanation or theory as to why the uh, civilization at Anchor ultimately declined and fell? Thanks. Yeah, that's a, actually, that's a really great question. And um, I think the short answer is no, um, because it, in fact, it does almost the opposite in um, asserting like, Basically, once you get to the the era of prosperity, um, it, it's just con it's a continuation down to the present. Um, yeah, so it it almost it, it completely skirts the issue actually. So that's that's a really good point. Yeah, so I want to go back to that question about the North Korean artists living in uh, Cambodia working. Uh, the question really, uh, is Christina asks this question about um, was it Cambodian or North Korean labor that built the museum? I am interested in the division of labor between the artists and the builders. Yeah, um, this is a, it's a great question. Um, and in this case, I really do not have the, uh, have not found any information about like how many were actually sent over 
from Mansa Day to actually perform the or to actually construct the the building. Um, yeah, still still looking into that. Um, yeah, I've mostly focused on on the artists who are there, and um, a, about twenty artists, and then uh, five stayed on to to um, maintain it. Others went to, uh, for example, the Beijing Gallery um, or back to Pyongyang. Um, yeah, and so, but also the other thing that they had to, or an aspect of life in Cambodia for these artists was um, they wanted to run the uh, a kind of um, souvenir style studio out of this where they're selling these very sort of kitschy paintings like um, in the video there's dogs and such um, but then there's also sort of scenes from everyday life in Cambodia and it this may tie back to the question about like imperialist functions and histories of museums because um, in this case I think it it I get the sense from some of these images um, in that uh, they're trying to produce images that will be attractive to the, the foreigner um, who is coming to, to Siam Reap as a tourist. Um, and I say that because you can see a lot of very similar paintings just sold on the streets in Cambodia, um, particularly around, um, say, um, mountains that are popular for um, sunset hikes and, and these uh, tourist centers. Um, you know, it's very common to see them them sort of lined up on the ground. Have you been to other panoramas made by the Manjuta studio, such as uh, Sarah Velas believes that there's one in Malaysia as part of the Rice Paddy Museum? Okay, this is interesting because I I have never um, no I've never been to any um, outside of, of Pyongyang, um, and I, I didn't know that they had one in Malaysia, um, but that that's really helpful. Yeah, neither did I. That's really interesting. You know, when you start to try to map out where Mansude has left its mark, it's, it's yeah. pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, even in Frankfurt, Germany, I mean, really? like, I think, yeah, a, a kind of fountain mount, uh, monument, I think. Yeah, so it would be interesting to do like a Mansude footprint. Yeah. Uh, tracking its footprints, right? Um, uh, I guess a different question would be, do you know... Um, the Mansude artists constructed a panoramic de depiction of the Arab take back of Sinai. Do you know anything about this joint venture in 1990s? Do not know this one either. So thank you so much. Yeah, it's just amazing how, um, you know, so many people have uh, uh, an experience of, of actually seeing or knowing about Mansude um, in context that you, you would never think. Yeah, so this is uh, a museum in Cairo, Egypt. So that's fascinating. I was there, I, I don't recall, um, but okay, I could be wrong, yes. So this is absolutely fascinating. All right, well, uh, I'm gonna ask one final question that seems to be echoing in this Q&A chamber here um, on uh, numerous occasions, and that is they really want to know how to get a hold of that recording. I know you answered it before, but people are asking, how can we get the recording? Um, well, maybe, I don't know if, um, would GWIX host it <laughs> or uh, on the YouTube channel or, um, I mean, I can, I, I will make it available sometime, um, probably on YouTube. Um, I'll, I'll talk with, with the, the staff and see if we can get it up on the, the GWIX YouTube page. That way everyone that's um, um, in this orbit will, will, be able, will know where to, to search for it. I'm glad it was so popular. I kind of, I found it on eBay um, by chance uh, some time ago and then thought it would be a good opportunity to, to um, broadcast it out into the, to the ether. Well, this lecture is going to be on our uh, GWIX YouTube site. So if, um, this I would just ask if, um, if anyone like actually listens to the other um, songs for the other countries. Um, please, like, be in touch with me if you have any uh, thoughts about it, because uh, I'm super interested in it as well. Yeah. As for the song, uh, copyright issues. Uh, we'll check. I will check into that. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, it would be fascinating to have it up um, and for everyone else to listen to. I think it's just uh, there's a high demand here apparently, so we'll definitely look into that. Otherwise, uh, I want to thank 
uh, our special guest, uh, Douglas Gabriel, for his fascinating talk. And I want to thank all the participants who asked wonderful questions, very intriguing, very uh, thought provoking. And I hope you guys have a wonderful afternoon and nice weekend. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much.